Welcome back to the Pastori podcast. It is still May when we are recording this, so we wanted to stay on track with Celiac Disease Awareness Month. And today we are talking about one of the more well-known diagnostic markers, if it's used correctly, for celiac disease, but it's also not very well understood. So it's a common way for physicians to diagnose it, but even if you have celiac disease, you may not know what this is, and that is tissue transglutaminase. Uh, the short form is TTG. So Dr. Pastori, I would love to get your insight just on uh, using tissue transglutaminase for a diagnosis compared to a biopsy. Yeah, I think that that's such an important piece of information. Um, here in the United States, biopsy definitely is invasive and it is a potentially costly procedure depending on the insurance coverage that the individual has. Um, but facts be told, it's the most definitive gold standard form of diagnosis for celiac disease, at least here in the United States. And I've written about and talked about and even published uh, a paper on celiac disease diagnoses um, last uh, November in 2019. And I mentioned um, the benefits and the pros and cons to a biopsy and the risks of you could, you could miss information if you don't have a biopsy. And I'm also very well aware in Europe, uh, they do recommend a specific threshold of blood levels with the genetics present uh, to allow a person to receive the diagnosis. I just want to state everyone that I know and work with, the top gastroenterologists in the world of celiac disease diagnostics, we all want to move away from the biopsy. So let me make that really clear. We just don't feel that it's the safe enough time right now to do that. There's not enough solid clinical evidence. Therefore, when we're going to recommend a biopsy, we wanna have the most solid clinical evidence we can to get a patient to that point. So when, it's when, like the yes. pretest to say a biopsy is needed for concrete diagnosis. Yes, exactly. It is, it is a precursor to getting a diagnosis and a very important precursor. And what I'm referring to, one component is, is tissue transglutaminase antibodies, specifically known as anti-tissue transglutaminase antibodies. So that's one excellent piece of evidence where you actually have these antibodies toward an enzyme uh, that is specific in celiac disease. And that enzyme is known as anti-tissue transglutaminase antibodies, or the enzyme itself is tissue transglutaminase. Uh, and they can be IgA derived and they can be IgG. So there's two different enzymes and I will uh, talk about that today. Um, but I think it's important that I define it, right? Because I can't tell you how many times I've had people say to me, tissue transglutaminase is an antibody. And I say, no, um, it, can, it can have an antibody reaction attached to it. But what tissue transglutaminase is, it's, it's actually an enzyme and it's highly dependent, not for every action, but in celiac disease, it's highly dependent upon a mineral called calcium. And when you have tissue transglutaminase combined with calcium, it actually does something known as the transamidation of proteins. And that's a very important word, uh, believe it or not in gastroenterology, transamidation. So when you have that in organic chemistry, and I'm gonna get a little bit technical, but I promise I'll explain myself. Um, that's the process of actually transferring something in organic chemistry known as enamide group from one compound to another, actually strength changing its structure. And a my group um, is basically how you would say to someone, glucose has a chemical formula, C6H12O6. We all kind of know that since we're in grade school. And a my group is C0 or O for oxygen, COHN2. And that's just a classic amide group. So you're actually taking this compound of these atoms together and switching them over to something else to actually change the structure. So that's kind of interesting. It's also what's important to understand about this substance, tissue transglutaminase, is it's part of a family. So it's part of this family of enzymes known as protein glutamine gamma glutal transferases. And I definitely promise you I'll have the spelling for that <laughs> uh, on, the, on the show notes because it's a real, it will win every Scrabble game. I don't even know if there's enough letters. Um, but it is important to understand this because what these enzymes do is they actually catalyze, they stimulate the modification of proteins. Hmm. That's and very important. Is the building block of pretty much everything in your body. Yeah. And how they do it, which is so nasty and deleterious in my disease, in celiac disease, in the disease we're discussing. There's multiple ways they will change a structure. 
And when you change the structure, you can make something really um, look so foreign that the immune system is going to go crazy to bind to it and create a war. So this is part of that process. So what it does is it creates this modification of proteins at specific side chains. Amino acids have side chains when you're studying them. Um, for example, there's, um, there's uh, side chains that you could find on lysine, and that's involved in so many different types of chemical reactions. Interestingly enough, in celiac disease, it's really glutamine, and we'll talk a little bit about today that today, um, where there's some damage that's done, some changes that are done. But specifically, there's modifications made to proteins at very specific sites. There's something also known as cross-linking that can transpire with the aforementioned lysine residues that are on a substance. And both of these processes are involved in something known as deavidation where you're actually changing a structure. So in biochemistry, you're converting amino acids into another amino acid just by an enzymatic activity. So said in English, this family of enzymes can actually take several amino acids, glutamine, asparagine, um, uh, polypeptides that are found, different amino acids stuck together, and actually change them completely into like glutamic acid or aspartic acid, which if you're a regular listener to this podcast, you know those are other amino acids and those are completely being changed. Um, and in organic chemistry, just so everyone knows when I mentioned an amide, that's, that's like this just substance that contains these different types of, of, of uh, molecules and then you're transferring them over to something else which clearly is gonna change that structure. So that's really where we have the main problems is when we have this type of reaction. Um, in organic chemistry, there's also the conversion of an amide to a called boxylic acid. And if you remember from an, an old podcast we did, and I couldn't tell you the episode, Lexi, I, we're up to 50 something. But what we did, um, what, what transpires um, with that, a carboxyl group, first of all, for those that, that may not know, or maybe you remember from listening to the podcast, it's where you have a carbon with two oxygens ending with a hydrogen. And that's just a very classic carboxyl group that we know on every fatty acid. So if you're studying fatty acids in undergrad education, you could find the carboxyl group really easy. If you're studying amino acids in, in functional nutrition or in you know, gross anatomy, discovering how amino acids work and um, hypertrophy of musculature, you're definitely looking at the structures of amino acids and you're seeing that same famous carboxyl group therein. What happens with everything that I said is all these activities will have an end result in leaving a protein structure that is completely or highly resistant to being broken down through enzymes and the normal process of digestion. We call that proteolysis or enzyme protein breakdown. That is just completely truncated. It's, it's shortened and stopped and it doesn't allow it to transpire. But one big thing I want to know, I want everyone to know before moving on is tissue transglutaminase is just not something that magically, enzymatically happens in a celiac disease individual. It's a member of this family of enzymes that are ubiquitous in the body, not just in cases of celiac disease, but it's a crucial link to celiac disease progression. Um, this enzyme is involved in everything from how cells tell the, that they're done growing, known as apoptosis, when they're going to commit cellular suicide. Um, tissue transglutaminase is involved in metastatic cancers. Tissue transglutaminase is involved in neurodegenerative diseases. And you can even find the enzyme in heart muscle tissue. So it is a very ubiquitous enzyme. And we were just very lucky that it was something that we could use to identify in celiac disease. Now, before we get into further conversation, I just want you to emphasize the difference between gluten and glutamase, because I know they sound the same. You've got like glutamine and gluten. So people are going yeah. to associate tissue transglutaminase mm -hmm. with gluten. That's another great point. And uh, no, uh, tissue transglutaminase is the, the enzyme that plays a role in changing one of the protein components of gluten, specifically its gliadin. Um, changing its charge and structure and what it looks like as a molecule. So to, to completely remove confusion, um, it is the substance that takes gluten as if it was clay or a child's Play-Doh, which is ironic because it contains wheat, um, a child's gluten-free Play-Doh like my daughter has, and actually morph its structure and what it looks like um, and molds it into something else. So that's it's not to be confused with gluten itself, Excellent question because we want people to be able to understand that one's an enzyme and one's actually a substance that we find in our in our diet. 
And then glutamine is an entirely different thing as well, correct? Yeah, gl glutamine <laughs> is a, yeah, awesome, thank you for that. You have to push me, right? So, so glutamine is an amino acid that's extremely important. The bulk of glutamine that we eat in our diet doesn't even leave the gastrointestinal tract. It's critical for helping normalize the enterocytes and the cells that line the gastrointestinal tract particularly the small intestine, the enterocytes. So it's really important as a fuel source and an energy source for those cells. It has incredible healing properties and it makes other substances. Glutamine will become glutamic acid. It can become um, a GABA, uh, but it's a real important amino acid that is not also to be confused with gluten. So they all start with G-L-U-T, but they <laughs> all have very different purposes um, and reactions and just they're different things. So yes, I think science loves to be confusing. Yes, it's very true. <laughs> so let's get into the role of tissue transglutaminase with celiac disease. So if we all have it, even if we celiac, why is this an indicator and what's happening when they're consuming gluten? You're awesome. And I think you're going to love the answer. And the way you ask the question is going to make me simplify an answer that I probably would have given that would have been more complicated. So let's just talk about the pathophysiology, something that I actually um, have just committed to memory, because uh, there's just some steps that are just so awesome. And I'll show you how there's this beautiful simplicity to understand the relationship. So first you have to imagine a celiac disease person sits down and, and eats a crouton or any substance that contains gluten. Gluten enters this area in the small intestine, specifically the duodenum. It goes into an area called the submucosa. So we have layers to our intestines and that surface layer is known as the mucosa. And right below that the submucosa is where gluten is, is taken up uh, in that area, the first part of the small intestine where we have the bulk of our digestion and unfolding and absorbing of some key nutrients and the shutter, shuttling along to the liver for other uh, dissemination of nutrients. Um, so that results in a production of autoantibodies to tissue transglutaminase. So tissue transglutaminase appears when gluten is in the submucosa. It is released as a sign of injury and inflammation. And prior to being able to do anything to the gluten molecule with our own digestion, which in celiac disease, of course, doesn't work, it's paralyzed. Tissue transglutaminase is already hard at work on that gluten it consumed um, enzymatically, changing its charge and its structure. And that in the celiac disease patient creates the binding of the unique genes we have. And the one, one that you have, Lexi, known as the HLA genes. So it requires that immune system reaction with tissue transglutaminase changing the gluten molecule that fosters the binding of gluten, how it's now changed, into two pardon me, two, HLA, DQ2, and DQ8, and that attacks, attaches to those receptors, and that stimulates this pro-inflammatory cytokine response, including interferon gamma uh, and all these other types of nasty things, lymphocyte presence, glidin-specific uh, CD4 T cells, which we talked about on, a, on another podcast, all because of tissue transglutaminase. So that was the binding response that then morphed it, and then it turns into this really nasty autoimmune reaction that at the end game results in the atrophy of the duodenal villi and microvilli, but by the same token also can pry open those intestinal tight junction cells and let this aforementioned immunological compound reaction, antigen and antibody response circulate throughout the body and the bloodstream. And that's how we can actually catch it in a moment in time is thankfully in many cases, um, the majority, the sheer majority of cases we will produce anti-tissue transglutaminase antibodies that are specific. Specific, for example, to an immunoglobulin. Immunoglobulins have different letters associated with them. They have different functions. We'll keep this very simple. The predominant immunoglobulin in the gastrointestinal tract that can call the arms is known as SIGA or secretory immunoglobulin IgA. And that will start floating around in the bloodstream attached to a tissue transglutaminase gluten-based structure as an enemy, calling the immune system to attack it. And with luck, you would be able to present those in your physician's office on a blood test and be able to see some positivity there. So with those blood tests that people are going to ask their physicians for, you said sometimes they might not even be present. So when they do go to a physician, what should they be discussing? <laughs> 
Yeah, and this is where it gets a little tricky. So with tissue transglutaminase, the most common test that is run, and I'll talk a little bit about the sensitivity as to why it's the most common test, if you don't mind, in specificity, is what's known as the tissue transglutaminase IgA. So it's known as a, let's simplify the dialogue, TTG IgA. So in the path towards a diagnosis, the reason that one has been chosen and really stuck is the fact that it has sensitivity and specificity of over 90% in children and adults. And if I could get very specific, in children, and this goes to, God, I stopped this research on the exact numbers that I'm about to give you in November of 2019, and I can't imagine them changing much by then. They would only get better. But in children, the sensitivity ranges from 93.1% to 95.7%, and the specificity ranges from 96.3 to 99% in the pediatric, that's like almost you know perfect. And in adults, the range of sensitivity is a little bit more leeway, but still really great, 90% to 95%, and the specificity is 95.3 to 98%. And if I could just remind our listening audience that the sensitivity is the ability to identify individuals with the disease. So that's the true positive rate, not false positives. You are positive. That is the specific definition of the sensitivity. So it's still estimating that roughly you've got five to 10% where it's not, but it's one of the best solid tests out there. Yes, it's one of the best solid tests out there and it should be combined with others. And I definitely will talk about that. But the specificity uh, is the ability to identify those without the disease at all. And that's a real important thing to understand because we call this the true negative rate, right? So that means versus a false negative, right? You want to make damn sure the individual is not, I'm not recommending a biopsy. And that's why I'm so comfortable that those ranges are so high. In pediatrics, it's 96.3 to 99. In adults, it's 95.3 to 98.3. That's awesome. You're giving me a really small margin for error. And in addition to that, I do a lot more testing to make sure I basically erase that error. So with that data in mind, one can see why tissue transcontaminase IgA is the cornerstone to making a diagnosis. However, um, I prefer to start with a secretory immunoglobulin IgA or have an SIGA total run in addition to a tissue transcontaminase IgA for the following reason. And I know you're very well aware of this. There's a 15 fold increase in an SIGA deficiency in celiac disease patients. And I am raising my hand because that was me. So I eluded the most common form of diagnosis. Isn't it interesting how I can just keep no bias in science and love this test even though there is no way I could pass it? Uh, so it's, it's so important to, to, to state that because a lot of doctors are not aware of that. We know that, we talked about that on, on a prior podcast, just talking about how other researchers identify that doctors were not vigilant enough. And I can tell you just from my years, many years in clinical practice, I would just run a classic panel SIGA, TTG IGA, but then I run a lot more and I'll talk about some of those. And I would have people show up either deficient in SIGA and say, well, then that, that everything that we did that was IGA was moot. And we need to take this other pathway that is very, very well validated in the clinical literature in your unique case. Of course, I wouldn't recommend a tissue transglutaminase IgG, which has a different set of sensitivity and specificity for someone that has normal IgA, it's kind of an, it's kind of overkill and a moot point. I use it only when I'm looking for antibody evidence to rule in or out a biopsy path for an individual where I highly suspect celiac disease, especially when it's that of my colleagues also call me in and go, hey, what's going on here? I already ruled this out, it can't be celiac disease. And then I take a swing at the bat and I say, hold on a second, I found something. And, and that's where we don't wanna miss that. So. In the case of a selective IgA deficiency, which is just really easy to understand, it's if you're basically deficient on a test. You're well below the reference range or you have like one or less than one on a numerical value for your test result for, do you even have the antibody that we could test against for gluten reactions and lead us to celiac disease? In that case, you wanna run the IgG version of tissue transglutaminase and you should run something that has been shown to be very sensitive and specific in these cases, which is known as gliadin deaminated antibody IgG. And thankfully, it also has an abbreviated term known as DGGL. And that is a blood test um, that you can easily get. Now, what's also interesting, Lexi, is there's some nuance here. 
So I've ha also been called in on cases where the SIJ is below aged matched values. So the individual is not deficient, but no one ever said, oh, my patient's 32. What's the SIGA for a 32 year old based on all the databases? What is that? And if I find a patient below that age reference range, then I say, well, I want to do different things. I want to definitely run the TTG IgA because they still have IgA present, but I want to add IgG and see if they have a dominant response. And I want to add one more thing, which thankfully has an acronym, but I want to add a gliadin deaminated antibody IgG and IgA. And that test is abbreviated a DGLDN. And that is a real critical test. And I'll tell you, when I'm called in, I'm usually the end game call. I'm like the, the team's in trouble. It's the fourth quarter. And, you know, we have no more timeouts and we, we need to score some points. So when I get that call, in many cases, I just say, here's what I'm going to do. I'm running a TTG IGA, a TTG IGG, a DGLDN, and I'm really going to get a full picture in addition to HLA, DQ2, and DQ8s. So I'm really getting all the values that I would want. And needless to say, at that point, I already have an SIGA in my hand, but the person's flirting with a lower level than normal. I the can only news. imagine how many people have gone to their doctor to be tested for celiac disease. <laughs> they run the TTG IgA without the total IgA. And it's like, oh, no, you're fine. Go back to sure. eating gluten, living your life. And it's destroying them and literally killing them. I, I have caught many cases of that. I've caught cases of small bowel cancer and that was behind it. And thank God the patient is well and completely recovered and is doing amazing things with her life. She's a school teacher and it's, that, that's just amazing feeling. Um, but yes, that, that is extremely commonplace and it bothers me like crazy. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm just doing everything I can to try to change how this is thought about in the medical doctor's office. Because look, we all want that amazing luck of the person has a phenomenal, either normal or elevated SIGA. And then we simply look at the TTG IGA results. And if I could use the Mayo Clinic scale, which I also have committed to memory, if someone is between 4.0 units per milliliter and 10.0 uh, uh, units per milliliter of um, specifically TTG IGA an uh, antibodies, so they have the anti-TTG IGA antibodies for gluten between four and 10, that's still not a home run. There, that's what's called equivocal. And I get uncomfortable because I've all, we didn't talk, we never talked about that together, Lexi. Then I get those cases on my desk and they're told, well, let's just watch and wait. Keep eating the gluten and the muffins and let's check again in another several years. Yeah. I like to, yeah. I like to, it's very true. I like to take those cases and I run a follow-up that has a DAGL, which is the gliadin deaminated antibody IgA. And they, because they're making some IgA, it's just equivocal. And then I add the huge, I know it's an expensive one. You know, we have a long dialogue about it, but it's known as the anti anti missile antibodies IgA. It is an expensive test. It either needs like umbilical tissue or monkey esophagus tissue. I kid you not. Um, it's highly, okay. it's highly <laughs> Sorry, I was laughing at your face. We see each other to the listening audience. We're not just on a phone. You know, we're very personable and gregarious people and we need to look in each other's eyes. Um, so it's, <laughs> yeah, they, it's, it's uh, pretty wild, but it's extremely sensitive. It's extremely sensitive. And yes, I've even had doctors say to me, why don't you just do that all the time? Because one, it's crazy expensive. Um, two, it actually doesn't work all the time. Mm -hmm. I was negative and my case was missed on an anti endomysial antibody IgA. Hey all the money and still not have it work and not get a true diagnosis. Yeah. So I, so I really save it for these, I save it for pediatric cases and I save it for cases where someone's between four and 10 on a Mayo Clinic scale. Uh, look, if, if I'm blessed and I've had a couple of these and then I'm like, really, you didn't see that. If I get someone that has an awesome IGA total, then they have a TTG IGA that's greater than 10 phone call biopsy a ASAP done stat case closed. They're, they're going to go off and get a biopsy. And, and that's I think one of the it's most important, important also to bring up that in order for the antibody to be present, you need to be consuming gluten. 
Yeah, it's absolutely important. And, and if I can, I want to bring up two very important points. And I think I could summarize some really two cool points. I believe it or not, I thought of these as I mentioned that I was going to think of those things to you, but then they, they hit me as we're talking. So the reason TTG has such two critical, important roles in celiac disease, you have to be consuming gluten. Thank you, Lexi, that triggered it. And what happens is this, this enzyme acts upon uh, gluten and it actually creates the immunological stimulatory event, connecting it with your unique genetics as a celiac disease patient. So that's awesome. And the second thing it does is it gives us a target autoantigen for the immune system response that we could measure. But I can't make this clear enough. You have to have gluten in the system. Specifically, it's known as gliadin. It's a fragment of gluten that's the most toxic for celiac disease patients. And it makes an excellent substrate for anti-tissue transglutaminase to elevate via IgA or IgG. And it's so important because that's what results in this deamination, the changing in particles, you actually make them negative charged. And then that gives it a higher affinity for these HLA genes you have. And therefore um, that's why TTG, IgA, and even IgG is considered the main step towards the celiac disease diagnosis. Now in celiacs that are consuming a little bit of gluten, like it's not a daily staple, they're not having pasta or anything like that. Let's say, they have like a little bit, like you said, croutons on a salad. Would that still be sufficient enough for them to get an accurate diagnosis? Or would yeah, you and then like yes. Shove gluten in your face. Yeah, you know, I have a saying with celiac disease patients, myself included, it takes a crumb. You know, for us, it takes a crumb to start this cascading event in that very small quantities of gluten over the threshold of tolerance, which is 20 parts per million, just general. There's people that suffer much less. I'm one of those people. But let's just say, argument's sake, government regulations, 20 parts per million. Imagine how tiny that is, right? So they're exposed to that, and they have this massive cascading events that starts with all these aforementioned immunological reactions. And, and also at the same exact time, something that's common in the news right now is the cytokine storm transpiring in the gut. We talked about it associated with COVID-19, but here we have it in the gut of celiac disease patients, and it causes nausea and vomiting within just hours. So it's a real small amount. So the cool thing is, yeah, in a real celiac, you'll catch that. The downside is that real enormous path I talked about in the different pathways and even the numerical value changing the way you think towards the diagnostic path. That's the funnel where I can't get enough patients in. You know, what drives me nuts is why does it have to be when you reach my desk? I'm honored to have the privilege to try to help you, but why could it have not been done years prior and saving this person whatever miserable disease they have associated with it? You know, that's so important to understand, right? We talk about my story all the time, but I hear those stories on a virtually daily basis of how other people have suffered. That's why the average time to diagnosis is 10 years. And I call it the duration of diagnosis, the decade to diagnosis. It doesn't make sense. So it's, it's all those different nuanced pathways. But if you include that in there the right way, it is an incredible weapon to have in your arsenal to get the right diagnosis. So even if you are over 10 on your test, you still say, go get a biopsy to get the absolute confirmation. Yeah, I do. I do. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you why. Um, we want to be definitive. There's cases of people actually not um, having full celiac disease. And there was other weirdo reasons, uh, being honest. I know it's not a scientific term, weirdo reasons. Um, they could have had some various types of... Um, uh, in giardia, inflammation, parasitic organisms that created an upregulation of immunological responses. And that's always a concern. There's also the missing pathology that we get at the same time. And that really is the sticking point for me. And that was something I wrote back to a physician when they were reviewing um, my clinical decision support system was, you know, why can't we just base it on the blood work? And I kept thinking of the work of Dr. Murray, who I just idolized so much. And it's an honor to have him as a co-author and a colleague and someone I've just admired for years and years and years. And to, to have published with him, I don't know, man, I guess I could just pack it in. It's all downhill from there. Uh, but in all seriousness, Dr. Murray said some real astounding things that I actually got to see in practice. Sometimes that biopsy shows us cancer. So yep, we got the patient diagnosed with celiac disease, but they also have small intestinal cancer, the jejunum, the duodenum, the, the ileum is cancerous. So we see that and have the evidence. We also have secondary infections that we can identify. We also can have some H. pylori, which can play a role in ulcers and is also transmittable um, to, to loved ones and partners. So that, that's very important to try to identify and we miss all that information. But this is a lifelong disease and you don't want to make a mistake of having a misdiagnosis. 
which is why I'm a, it's a big deal for me with sensitivity and specificity. And my training at Rutgers was like unbelievable on that and the mathematical values of prevalence and being 100% certain in everything from identifying a specificity of who should get a specific treatment and who would fail miserably on that same treatment, even though it's so wonderful for a disease state. Um, it's, it's so important to understand that and not have any errors. And, and what we're also learning, last point is, uh, the, uh, another great argument by Dr. Murray and the CAMP, the American uh, Gastroenterology Association, the AGA, is not all labs are completely the same. Notice when I was talking about values, I said I'm going to use Mayo Clinic standardizations. And when I say that, what I mean is I'm making believe the person who's listening to me was at the Mayo Clinic when they had their blood drawn. And I know how their tests are calibrated and I know what those ranges mean, but I don't know what, those, what the lab is doing in Peoria, Arizona. Uh, I'm not picking on Arizona or you know, Seattle, Washington or New York City. There's such a diversification and there's such a lack of standardization of labs. That's where we're having some problems. And I really think that we also have to take into account that, so sorry to say this, we're as close as you can get, but no one test is 100% accurate. And I know we covered this in previous podcasts and you wrote an entire article on it, but would you recommend once people get diagnosed via biopsy confirmed that they get their TTG IgA redone yes. in the months after if it was part of their diagnosis? 100%. Any path towards pathology, any path towards pathology in English, any path of blood test towards your unique diagnosis must be repeated and you should do that at the latest the first start at month six i always believe in seeing a doctor at month three because there's so many things that transpire and i can't even tell you another thing which we talk about all the time but see like these patients come to see me and never were worked up for any type of nutritional deficiency which is incredibly commonplace and i wrote a whole article on the most common deficiencies associated with celiac disease. Um, but yes, it's, it's absolutely important. It's how we know you're even not being exposed, that you're doing everything right. And the gastrointestinal tract is starting the healing process just by watching you decrease that no massive immunological value. And it really doesn't even start to decrease until month six, but you want to watch a trend. You actually want to see a trend. So you in your to... clinical practice, if you saw someone come in with a temp, um, at month three or month six, if they have been following a militant gluten-free diet, what do those numbers look like when you retest them? But typically, they would move into the equivocal range, anywhere between four and seven. Um, it, 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 of course, it varies, and everybody's completely different, but asking me in my practice, and these people suffered a long period of time, their guts are really struggling, and I got my hands in there, and found out what was going on, usually around a four, and they still would be flagged, you know, and you'd be shocked, Lexi, again, how many doctors just blew that off and did not feel that that was relevant enough. Um, but that's not what we're, certainly not what's coming out of the Mayo Clinic, where, where the great Dr. Joseph Murray has his whole, like, celiac disease wing, for lack of a better term, they're really getting uh, deep into the nitty gritty of the diagnostics of it and treatment. Um, but yeah, so that, that's kind of blown off and that would at least show me the person's in a downward trend. And then at the end of one year, I expect them to be completely normal. They're where they're negative, they're non-reacting, and that means they're clean. And, and I do recommend all celiac disease patients every time they go for their normal history and physical, after they have that follow-up, I talk about the three, um, six and 12, I have an article and a podcast covering that follow-up. Once they do those full follow-ups every year, they see their primary care physician. Um, they absolutely should have their diagnosed enzyme antibody retested. So if it is the most common tissue transglutaminase, be it IgA or IgG, they should have it done. I should add this caveat. If the patient was SIGA deficient and then you treat them for celiac disease, you probably could guess their IgA goes up. That happened to me. My IgA is great. It's so normal for my age. I'm so grateful about that. And it has been since about year three of my diagnosis. I still get it now in anti-tissue transglutaminase IgA because now I have IgA and it's so sensitive and specific. Why not see if I got punked when I had that salad at that super healthy organic place in California? Let's now test my blood and see what's up. So that's another thing that you would recommend is if you suspect that you've been glutened to also get this test run again. 
Yeah, I do. When you're following up with your doctor, it's not as it won't nail it right at the moment in time. And I'm actually working with a group to actually have a method of doing that. There's some really cool tests where you could do urine tests. There's tests you could do a saliva test where you could actually prove that you were exposed. So that's awesome. And you'd be able to just eradicate the whole question in your head. But was I exposed or not? So that would help you. Needless to say, in the absence of that, you need to be super vigilant. What, what this test would do and why I recommend getting this test done by your doctor, and your doctor should absolutely do it routinely on you, is if you are kind of asleep at the switch or relaxed at the, at the wheel and you say, well, I'm doing everything right and maybe you're still na nagging health concerns, but you already had that biopsy diagnosis so you're following a gluten-free diet to the best of your knowledge. Take it from me, you know, I'm a published scientist in the field of celiac disease research and I've gotten punked telling the chef everything they need to hear, I've gotten sick. And if you are as militant as I am, bless your heart. But you know, I have like publications and degrees on the wall that are like, I know my stuff and I'm still getting pumped. So imagine if I didn't, and I was to have doing that on a routine basis, I would have this evidence that would pick it up. And my doctor would say, Hey, you're going to damage your intestines all over again. Yeah, especially um, like spices and condiments that even though they say gluten-free, if they're not certified gluten-free, cross-contamination can play a role in there. Oh, yeah. um, medications we talked about, supplements, yes. they can be packed with gluten um, and you might be ingesting it and you're like, well, I can't figure out why it's not going down. This test would make you do further investigation. Thank you for bringing up the awesome point of medications and that the group that I'm involved with where I'm a, a patient advocate, which is the Celiac Disease Foundation, uh, they've done phenomenal work fighting the government to make laws that pharmaceutical companies have to disclose that gluten is one of the excipients. An excipient is an inert ingredient that's used in the manufacturing process. And a lot of people love gluten or gliadin because it binds to things right? It holds things together. So it can hold drugs together neatly within their capsule or enteric coating. And we don't want that in the realm of celiac disease. So there's been a big push by the Celiac Disease Foundation to demand the full list and issuing that information to the public. And I'll be honest, it's not 100% certain. So I do like really deep screening and have to write letters and contact pharmaceutical companies of patients that may be on prescription medications that are for their life to save their lives to make sure that they're free of gluten if that patient is indeed celiac disease. In cases of non-celiac gluten intolerance, it's really a very specific thing. As you know, and you have talked about on this podcast, you know, I, I'm pretty sure, and I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure parts per million wouldn't, wouldn't affect you. No, but I think no, if you no. went overtly, right, something you could see, right? You're like, I'm going to have this Jersey Mike sub uh, you know, with a big old whole wheat bun, that probably would knock you two ways from Sunday. And that was, of course, something that, that was visual. But in, in celiac disease patients, this is also a cool way to reverse engineer sleuthing. And I've used it where I had a case of polypharmacy, that just means a person on a lot of meds, that has celiac, and they're also being treated for like multiple sclerosis. You're not going to stop their meds, right? No way. And then you say, hey, why are you equivocal this year? What, what changed? Well, this, 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 nope, I've been locked down. I haven't even gone to a restaurant. Kind of like right now in quarantine, it's been a lot easier. Um, but you, you know, then I start saying, well, what's in these medications? Because you're definitely being exposed minutely and it's causing your TTG IgA, which was one of your diagnostic, diagnostic values, to now start to get into that range of they're in the middle and we need to know more and we need other diagnostic values to tell us more. Uh, and it's harmful. Please understand if you have celiac disease and you're diagnosed on a biopsy and then you're exposed to gluten on a, on a regular basis, maybe once a week, you're going to get all those disease components back. You are going to damage the small intestine. It is going to shred away. You are going to lose the villi and microvilli. And I'm sorry, but it may lead to these really horrible things that we talk about on other podcasts, you know, shrinking areas of your brain, changing how your brain functions with white matter and gray matter, and go on a very, very long list of comorbidities that are associated with the disease. So if someone is looking to get diagnosed, you would still recommend genetics first and then blood work and then biopsy? For me, it would really be blood work. Uh, genetics is like a little cream of the crop thing. And I know it's really, especially in the States, not really covered by insurance. The great news is a lot of people are getting it done uh, and they'll come to me with it and they'll want to know more about it. And they may be confused that they have the disease and I'll show them how, you know, 30% of the population 
that doesn't have celiac disease have these HLA markers. They just have a slightly increased risk from 1% to 3% of the population. So it's important information, but it clearly doesn't mean a diagnosis. The, the, anti, the um, genetics really help if you have very bizarre cases, um, cases where you, you have a patient that has all the symptoms. They have borderline blood work, and then other markers are more positive, like the aforementioned um, IgGs. And then they are sent to a biopsy, and the biopsy is negative, meaning they don't have the evidence of celiac disease. I like to run a genetic panel definitely at that point and say, well, do, you know, what's my smoking gun? Did I catch them in a moment of time where it's not there? Should we look at this biopsy another way? Should I just say, okay, where did you have this biopsy done? Should I just get you in the Mayo Clinic now? Do you have the genes for me to have this conversation? And then I run those genes. But there's multiple reasons I'll run the genes. Uh, then someone will say to me, I've been gluten-free for a very long period of time. I don't want to put it back in my life. Do I even have a shot? And I'm in the group of doctors that believe you have to have HLA, DQ2.5, and DQ8 to have the disease. And if I'm proven wrong, it's such an extreme minority. With the amount of blood work I do, there's no way I'm missing it. Um, but I'm really in that group. And I'm in really good, you know, the, who agrees with me? The Mayo Clinic, the University of Chicago, um, you know, really big groups in Italy. So we're, we're really hyper-focused that those genes are so important. So for example, tomorrow I'm talking to people and I'm going to tell them, you don't have these genes. I don't know what another doctor told you. It's just, this is just not going to happen. This is not going to happen. You have something known as non-celiac gluten intolerance, and you know that by cause and effect, much like you, Lexi, but you do not have either one of these genes in the most sensitive measured way with as close to 100% accuracy as possible. So that always feels good. But I, I run it for those reasons as well. In a perfect world, I love it on everything. So I am spoiled where I'm called in when I need to really solve a problem. So uh, a normal celiac panel for me and my work, believe it or not, on a regular, I would say at least every other day basis, is everything. I run a tissue transglutaminase IgA, IgG, all the DGGLs, all of it. Deaminated gliadin IgA, IgGs, HLA DQ2, DQ8s, some subclasses of those, and then I have just at least eight to 10 pages of data that I really took a shot at this to validate what I'm thinking and what the patient is thinking. And then I have zero doubt of which way to turn them. And when I do that, it's because I'm called in as a last resort. But when I do that, I get zero pushback when I have my evidence from any physician who may not even be knowledgeable. They go, oh my goodness, we need to biopsy now when I get the positive. We will have all of the tests listed in the show notes. Uh, so it'll have a time summary breakdown, but we'll also include this as a separate thing that you can copy paste and bring to your doctor and say, here are the exact steps that I need you to do because a lot of physicians are not familiar with this. We talked a lot about that in our last podcast uh, last week. So listen to that if you haven't, but never hesitate to reach out to us, especially if you're having a doctor that is pushing back and saying, nope, you don't need this. Uh, Dr. Pastori is here to help you be an advocate for your own health. Absolutely. So that is it for this week. Be sure to check out Dr. Pastori at drrobertpastori.com. Uh, podcasts and articles are up there. And then he's also on social at Dr. Robert Pastori. We have a newsletter that goes out uh, occasionally as well from the desk of Dr. Pastori. So if you head over to his website, you can sign up for that and stay up to date on information that we're not even covering yet because it's uh, quite fresh. But Dr. Pastori stays up to date on everything. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for listening. We will see you next week.